so secretive was the Libyan state about this massive crime. They too are victims as families of people who have for so long disappeared before their fate eventually was confirmed. In Yemen too, recent protests reflect deeper grievances about the recurrent internal conflict in the country's northern Sada region, close by the border with Saudi Arabia, and a swelling secessionist movement based in Aden in the south, as well as the presence of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, drawing Yemen into the international war on terror with all that brings. As I've said, it, become, it seems clear that what happened in the past three months or so will be, seen, will be seen as a major shift. That is certainly my hope. But for now, the jury is still out. There is a determined fight back underway by those who still cling to power in Libya, Bahrain, Syria, and Yemen. And the belief also evidently that through force and repression and by exploiting lines of division within their societies, they can see off the protesters and their demands. Uh, we hope they will not succeed. All across the region, ordinary people have smelled the winds of change and they know that this is the moment, this is the time when they must stand up for their beliefs, for their rights, even in the face of tear gas, beatings and bullets. This truly has been one of the marks of change, the sheer courage and persistence of the protesters and their refusal to be cowed down, whatever is thrown against them. In many ways, what is going on now is reminiscent of those earlier heady days when the Soviet Empire crumbled, the Berlin Wall came down and new democracies emerged in Central and Eastern Europe, offering so much promise of change. Or even earlier days, around the time that Amnesty International was formed 50 years ago, when people throughout Africa escaped from the yoke of colonialism to face what turned out to be a very challenging and conflict-ridden future. As then, so now, the new mood for change sweeping through the Middle East and North Africa brings great hope, but also will present many challenges to the people of the region and to we, uh, others who interact with them in our global community. Of course, it is to, if it is to be re, uh, real and sustainable, change will and must be driven primarily by people in the region. However, we in the international community also have a very important role to play. We cannot be mere spectators. We have to get involved and help in every way that we can to ensure that the changes that do come benefit the people of the region and have at center the realization of their human rights the right to be free from oppression, discrimination and injustice, the right to education and health, and the right to be able to live with one's family in dignity. Now, working in collaboration uh, with human rights and political activists in Egypt and Tunisia, Amnesty International has already developed uh, a human rights agenda for change for each country, and we are actively promoting these right now. On the one hand, our agenda focuses on the laws, procedures and institutions and practices that have been used to facilitate repression and abuse and set out how these must be abolished or reformed in order to deliver the rule of law, ensure accountability, promote free speech and robust civil society, and enhance the role, status and active participation of women who have been in the forefront of the protests. On the other, our agendas look to the realization of economic, social and cultural rights, how to ensure that the needs of the poor, whether in rural areas or in the slums of Cairo and other cities, are put at the top of the list of state priorities and other communities are protected against discrimination and are allowed and able to play their full part to realize their full potential. Now, there is much that Canada can and must do to help. We look to your government, your institutions, your organizations to find ways in which you can support the inclusion and participation of women in determining the future of Middle East and North Africa, in continuing to support human rights activists and defenders in their invaluable work and in ensuring that corporate Canada maintains high standards and takes full account of human rights when it does business in the Middle East and North Africa region. Ladies and gentlemen, the changes we are witnessing have been much awaited, but their scale, speed, and even their outcomes have taken most of us by surprise. Few could have foreseen that the spark stuck in Tunisia uh, to overthrow its dictator, and today is the one, it is the one and perhaps the best promise of lasting positive change. Traditional political opposition forces neither initiated nor have taken over the revolution now underway. Change came from ordinary people manifesting all their diversity and a remarkable sense of civic responsibility. The national flag used as the common symbol. No party flags, no burning of flags. New media and social networks facilitated all that. But we cannot say for sure that without them, such revolutions would not have happened. Indeed, 
In Egypt, the authorities managed to block the internet and forced providers to suspend their services for a few early days in the unrest. Yet people kept marching into Tahrir Square in their thousands. This was truly people's power at its finest, its best. But clearly, new technology and means of communication were used to good effect by those organizing protests who use social networking, such as Facebook, to advertise and coordinate their plans, mobile phones, and the internet to expose the full horror and the violence of the state authorities' response, while satellite channels such as Al Jazeera helped bring the daily reality of what was going on in Tunisia, and particularly Egypt, into the homes and workplaces of uh, across the region, many of whom also then became inspired to take to their own streets to air their grievances and demand change. In the second half of 2009, social networking sites and mobile phones had also been used by protesters, again, largely young people in Iran, to organize the mass demonstration that followed President Ahmadinejad's disputed re-election. There, however, the protests were crushed by revolutionary guards and the notorious Basij militia killing and injuring protesters and rounding up and jailing those who call for change. I spoke yesterday at the Council on Foreign Relations in Montreal specifically on the role of new media in the human rights revolution in the Middle East and North Africa and some of it bears repeating here today. Recognizing that the digital divide restricts the use of internet technology to the privileged few, uh, there is still no doubt that particularly due to mobile phone availability uh, now much more widespread, the power of digital technology cannot be underestimated. New media combines speed, multimedia, and a capacity to circulate real-time content um, through a variety of peer-to-peer -peer and person-to-person -person channels. Unlike traditional media, the new media, especially mobiles, uh, are easy and low-cost to use. Most importantly, people seem to love them. Uh, and this is a major problem for any government that wants to restrict their use. The new media have launched a dramatic shift in the dynamics of personal and public communication. If traditional media, especially in their large institutional forms, are centralized, top-down, and unidirectional, new media are decentralized and network-based, personal and public, local and global, conversational and multi-directional. Old media voices tend to announce and pronounce new media voices, at least within the activist universe, are friends of dialogue and debate, connecting at a very local level. Interestingly, they also appear to be powerful conduits for political humor, the capacity to express and hear what is often unsayable, even unthinkable. Importantly, much of this takes place through personal, local, and vernacular voices, people's own experience, own needs, own understanding, and own voices. As such, the new feed, uh, media seem especially friendly towards enabling the open, egalitarian conversation that underpin the shared realization of all human rights. An essential step in stopping human rights abuse is to expose them to the light of public concern. The new, new media can do this across any distance at lightning speed and through content such as video and audio that can convey human experience and stories in compelling forms and in their own voices. The new media can also support privacy and safety. They help open independent spaces for alternative views and information they're tactically nimble in real time. With clever use, they can circumvent government-controlled media. They're also unique vehicles for friend-to-friend -friend messaging and thus powerful media for building public involvement. These qualities can be especially critical for women. Studies of mobile and internet use, of, uh, internet use in Egypt, India, Zimbabwe, and elsewhere indicate how digital media can support the need for safe spaces to communicate collaborate for access to reliable peer-to-peer -peer information, say, on matters of health, or for using personal experience to advance changes in the public sphere. So overall, from a social justice perspective, activist cyberspace often feels like the ever-emerging creation of a new, freely accessible public space, digital versions of the ancient Greek Agora, the Arab Maidan, the Piazza and Platz, the village shade tree, the public commons. It is this quite new and creative dynamic between these physical and digital commons that is so critical for openly reporting and sharing experiences, for contesting information viewpoints, and for building pressure for change. From a human rights perspective, the unrest in the Middle East and North Africa showed in a most compelling way how human rights are truly indivisible. The unemployed were clamoring for political rights, 
Poor people living in slums were among those facing arrest and torture, and everyone has been seeking freedom from fear and freedom from want. At the international level, the crisis in the Middle East and North Africa has exposed even further the hypocrisy of Western governments, willing as they are to implement military options against Gaddafi's Libya, yet not willing even to do a little bit more or little, be a little bit more outspoken about other repressive states such as Bahrain on account of its significant geopolitical and military importance to the West above all to the USA. Uh, today, I think some of you may have seen we, um, Alex uh, led uh, along with my colleague Beatrice from Montreal, uh, we launched something called uh, a Human Rights Agenda for Canada which lists some of our concerns uh, on, Can on the Canada's human rights record globally but also domestically and I just wanted to plug this as part of my, my speech here. Now in terms of the institutions of the international community, in a few short weeks this crisis has triggered decisions by the UN Security Council that would have been unthinkable only a few months ago. Now we have a much lower threshold for calling on the Security Council to refer a situation to the International Criminal Court. Um, and I'm happy to have Francis here who's a, who's a leading expert on this subject. This uh, amnesty called for this as well. It's a very welcome development. Uh, as well, Libya is the first country to have been suspended from the UN Human Rights Council, restoring somewhat the dent and credibility of that body. Uh, while the Security Council in Resolution 1973 has at its core the protection of civilians, including by military means, whatever one thinks of other aspects of the resolution and of the motives of those states which adopted it. But it is, but is what we are witnessing in the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa region, lasting change? That's a question mark. Will what emerges be comparable to the fall of the Berlin Wall and the reorganization of former Soviet influenced countries which successfully unified Germany and brought irreversible positive change elsewhere? Or will it prove to be more like the so-called color revolutions uh, that effectively led to changes at the top but left much of the repressive systems in place. As I said earlier, the jury is still out. In any case, most of the changes that have happened so far are for the better and we need to recognize this. Let's be optimistic but let us also put our minds and our resources towards helping turn such optimism into reality. The people in the Middle East and North Africa deserve nothing less. Thank you.